welcome to the Data Democracy. Presented by renowned O'Reilly author Ole Olsen Banyu. And powered by Xenia. Make your data accessible and discoverable by anyone, anywhere, at any time. Hi Suna, I'm happy to have you on. Hi Ole. Uh, and for the listeners out there, you're listening to The Data Democracy, and I'm your host, Ole Olesen Benjø, Chief Evangelist in Cinea and the author of the Enterprise Data Catalog, published by Rally. And so what I explore on this podcast is data democracy, what that is and how that works. And that's what we explore with uh, the guests. That's what we talk about. Today's guest is Sune selsbeck Reitz. Sune is a data evangelist working in Dement in Copenhagen, Denmark, where he empowers business professionals to make smart, data-driven decisions that lead to success. Suna is a member of Dharma Denmark, and he writes a LinkedIn newsletter that I really encourage you to subscribe to. It's called A Data Mind. I have given his newsletter a close read, as Suna has some interesting takes on the clash between safe, agile framework and the tasks in data management in general. It's a clash that seems almost inevitable and quite fatal, as you will hear in a moment. But before we do go into the details uh, to open the conversation, can you share a bit more on your professional experience sooner and what you do? Yes, certainly, Ole. But uh, first and foremost, I must express my gratitude to be invited on this podcast. I feel it's uh, very exciting and I'm looking forward to this conversation. While my educational background is in history and philosophy, my professional journey have primarily evolved around data management and BI reporting. In 2017, I embarked on a data journey simultaneously with an agile journey. Uh, I was taking on the role as a safe product owner for a small uh, BI team. And since there, my role has included being a safe product manager for an uh, art regarding data and data art, and also uh, being a product manager in IT, a broader role, you can say. But uh, just last, last year, I made a transition to the other side, to the business side. And presently, I served, as you said, as a data evangelist in portfolio and product management at Demand. Uh, with a primary focus on steering my organization towards a more data-driven approach and try to fostering a comprehensive experience for both our customers and our end users. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, it's, no, it's quite... no, no biggie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I would disagree. I think that's <laughs> a big task. So how did you... Uh... How did you find yourself transitioning from a role, from an educational background uh, in the humanities uh, into a more technical role in, uh, in industry? How did, how did that play out for you? Was it easy? Was it difficult? Uh, and what kind of skills do you, do you use in your daily work from, from uh, your educational background? Because I'm sure that there are some. Uh, there is uh, a lot, actually. But uh, the first and foremost is all to be always be critical at everything. You know, you have to question everything all at once. Mm -hmm. And just because other are doing something and it's been tried before, it may not be the answer to it. So that's why I'm uh, really enjoying being in this data field because it's it's still emerging, it's still mm -hmm. maturing, and uh, yeah. we, we're not done yet at all and um, the most of the things i'm focusing on in data and data management and data uh, my data journey is the ethical and privacy part of of uh, the, the whole thing and focusing on as you say data democracy and trying to get more people involved in data <laughs> and not just a specialist i'm not a specialist myself i'm not a technical specialist at least are more on a theoretical uh, scheme of uh, data. Yeah, yeah, I could imagine. And so, so tell me, for listeners not used to uh, encountering the role of a data evangelist, I mean, I have some 
I believe I have some pretty good ideas of what you do yeah. in your daily work. I may be mistaken, but but some people do not know this role uh, very well. Mm. Uh, so what's a what's a regular day on the job for you? <laughs> uh, my job at demand is uh, free folded. Uh, First and foremost, I am a business owner for our cloud art, our cloud and data art. So I am the responsible man from the business side doing the prioritize for the art. So that's the short term development in, in demand. We have at the moment seven different arts in, in demand. So a big safe transformation on the way. On the other hand, I am leading a new, newly established data governance cross functional team where we try to uh, make all the groundwork for yeah, data governments in, in general, so, you know, processes, policies, and uh, yeah, command ways, actually. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the last thing is that I am trying to um, collect and try to make a comprehensive data strategy for all of demand at the moment. So that's the biggest task of them all, I think. But my work is merely stakeholder management all the time, try to talk to both develop, developers, also C-level people. So, you know, it, it ranges from all sides of the company. Yeah, it's it's an extensive uh, role, uh, very, uh, very, very big tasks, if you ask me, that you uh, <laughs> have, been, uh, have been tasked with. So for the listeners, I think we need to explain uh, a little more in detail some of the safe terminology to get everything, oh, yeah. everyone on board here. What, can you just briefly elaborate? What is an art? An art is a group of people working within a greater settings. Uh, you have four to eight teams in an art. An art uh, or a team in an art is around six to eight people, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully cross-functional so they can take in a task and do it all by the same uh, themselves. But mm -hmm. an art should uh, should could uh, or could uh, develop a task all by themselves, not involving anything else or anyone else. This should mm -hmm. be a normal uh, autonomous. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the art, as I said, I am business owner for is the, the cloud art. So the cloud uh, interfaces and uh, yeah and data reporting. Oh yeah. So, and so a little more context. What 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 are the primarily the primary reasons to uh, implement a safe, agile uh, framework in an organization? I mean, I know this, but yeah. I want everyone in the in the <laughs> on the call to uh, to, yeah. to know it as well. So can yeah. you? Yeah, I can say in demand uh, is a, a fairly big company, we are merely twenty thousand people, and try to get everyone aligned on the same pathway. Uh, or the same strategy is uh, a hard one when you're not in our, uh, what can we say, organized framework uh, way. And SAFE put some transparencies into both uh, prioritization and also uh, how much work people can do. So you have a, a more uh, a pull from the developers and not a push for the management. So yeah, it's all down to prioritizing uh, the items and then yeah, the people doing the work are taking the amount of work they can. I've been part of a safe agile transformation myself a couple of times, and uh, I definitely see the potential. I mean, I won't, uh, in that respect, call myself an evangelist, but I, I definitely see the potential of safe agile. I mean, I've been part of IT organizations and working with IT organizations for all of my life were, were the opposite reality of an agile uh, framework was uh, was in place. And that is definitely a difficult place to be, right? Can, can, you, expl can you explain a little bit like the, the historic antecedents of, uh, yeah, of the realities before safe agile? Uh, before I, myself, I worked in, uh, in a safe, framework set up, I was uh, merely a project assigned worker at my old firm. And uh, I was assigned to four different projects for 160% of my time. So you can say I didn't get much done. It was also uh, always being a lack of time and, and try to catch up all the time. But now after SAFE being implemented in several uh, companies, this transparency and 
what we can do and what we're not going to do is yeah is the big thing here so we're not uh, doing things that will never uh, see the end so we, we we can do the most important parts first yeah yeah exactly exactly i mean i've been part of that too right where you sit uh like you could imagine a circle of 200 people very skilled yeah. people all kinds of backgrounds they know all kinds of programming languages mm -hmm. applications cloud platforms a lot of different frameworks talk of uh, itil a lot of things at play and, and everyone is just sitting there highly skilled highly paid and just looking at each other and nothing happens because yeah, exactly. it's it's all locked right you can't do anything because there's simply no mechanics we're still trying to find out Okay, how does an IT organization actually work, especially in in big enterprises, right? With a long history and, a, and an established uh, product portfolio, how on earth do we make IT deliver fast, high quality? Um, yeah, and incrementally. Yeah, so, exactly. So small, small portions of, of value, each and every, uh, not day, but each and every mm -hmm. week or month. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I guess that is... Um, that is at a very very high level a uh, safe uh, agile and and what uh, what it opposes the reality in it organizations prior to safe agile highly recommend for every every listener out there the the books by gene kim the unicorn project and uh, the phoenix project cool cool books uh, it's very where, good books yeah uh, f fictions uh, f like written like a page turner fictions it's it's really really interesting and they describe this difference between the old setup in it organizations and this fictive fictitious company called the parts unlimited right and and it's uh the way they describe the change from this old setup to a more devops development yeah. operations uh it's just fantastically written uh it's uh and you really get it in like reading frameworks i don't know how you feel about that sooner but i it's like multiple choice memory tests uh yeah. you have to you have to just memorize 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 it's not it's not bad but 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 these books they really got under my skin i really understood yeah. okay when 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 i wrote read those books i really really got it this is why we have to do it you have to get it under your skin and, and try it out for yourself at least in in the in a mindset uh Wait. Ex exactly, exactly. But the reason I invited you on sooner is because I follow your, as I said, I follow your, your newsletter quite closely. It's a data mind. You can find it on LinkedIn. And you have been putting forward some quite interesting ideas about the clash between safe agile and uh, data management in general. So, yeah. so can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. Um, you can say that in, in a safe framework, there is a lead time you have planned a program increment or also called a PI for a period of time in demand. We are choosing to do that each three months. So, you know, 12, 14 weeks. Uh, it could be as short as 10 weeks, but, but still 10 weeks is two and a half months. So, you know, and then you have to prepare a backlog and you have to groom it and all that, and they have to be prioritized by the business. And if you have, you know, a team, a BI team sitting in an art, from an idea from a business perspective to make a, a report or, or something, it will take at least 10 weeks to get it from idea to execution. And in, in a decision-making world as we are today, that time frame is not sufficient at all. Mm -hmm. We can say that the uh, safe framework can be uh, really good when it comes to building up a, a lake house or um, or other tooling in, in, in data management, master data government uh, governance, and a data catalog implementation, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, it will take time and it could do and can be planned down in epic uh, feature user story way of safe. But you know, the small thing, the ad hoc things, it, it cannot be done in a, in a safe world, uh, as I see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I find that very stimulating, and as a uh, as a mid mid life <laughs> data practitioner, 
I I have already seen quite a lot. Like I have been a leader and a specialist and an architect, and and people have kind of pushed and pulled me in all kinds of directions in these positions, and and so I immediately understood that you were onto something here with this thought of data management not being completely compatible with um with safe agile. I'm also certified in safe agile, <laughs> right? And and um. But you're saying it's the small things. Could you could you uh, could you expand on the small things a little bit? The the, the small things. There, there's a lot of good things in in the safe framework. You have the, mm. the, the data stand up. What you're doing today. What's your trouble and what you're gonna do to fulfill the task today and not tomorrow. Uh, that's a good thing. You have the spin review when you're inviting in stakeholders and seeing maybe not working software, but a halfway there, so you, you can steer the team in, in a direction. You have the, the plug, so you are always have the, the priorities aligned up. But, but you know, in, in SAFE, it's so much bigger. It's uh, also for a whole art or a, a agile relief strain. And it's just so much work for doing the little things. There is mm. too much overhead. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I would say at, uh, and a data art in a safe context should be a data management team and not a BI team. Yeah. One of the things we talked about uh, prior to, to making the recording sooner was, I think, I mean, I have a back background in library information science, which is both rooted in the humanities and rooted in, in more technical disciplines. It's, it kind of plays on both. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I really, really loved about this. Uh, <laughs> This field of study, and that's why I went all the way to 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 doing a PhD in in this field. It's this combination that I find very very necessary when we're talking about data. You need to have a technical understanding, but you also need to understand that data behaves just like language, right? It's it it can be interpreted in many uh, different ways. So you have to have an understanding of syntax, of semantics, stuff like that, intentions. So one of the things you talked about in our in our preparatory call was information needs. So what do people actually need to know, and how do they uncover this? It, it fits quite well into into this understanding of or this this idea that you put forward that there's a mismatch between data management, certain parts of data management, BI, and the art. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. one of my key points of going into this data world is also trying to get everybody interesting in data, data privacy, data ethics, at least. Mm -hmm. One thing is that you can do things with data. Other thing is, should you do things with data and which data and do you have the consent? What do people really want out of data? And and, and not, not just the employees, but also the, the end users, the customers. What can we do and what should we do to make the life easier? But at what cost? Mm -hmm. Always at what cost. You can just harvest all the data in the world and have it uh, stored in a data center and then it produces uh, uh, carbon and, you know, just mm -hmm. be being there and, and, and not being used by anyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we should collect the right data for the right purpose all the time. Yeah. We should not just collect data in hope that we can use it someday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It I, I really agree, and I think that that agenda will be become that w it will become more it will get more attention uh, as we uh, as we progress in techno technological uh, evolution uh, in the years to come. The ESG uh, agenda, in general, like uh, environmental uh, ag agenda, that will uh, definitely play a bigger role in data. So I I agree. But on the other side, you have uh, uh, the way. I see management looking at data is more that it's a reactive kind of work. We have a use mm -hmm. case. We have to uh, fulfill it and use some data to, to fulfill the use case. I'm some sort. Yeah. We do not, as you have in your book, uh, mentioned the, what's it called, data discovery team. Mm -hmm. You mentioned mm -hmm. that. A team that dedicated to going to look, to look at data and try to find uh, patterns and, and all that without using use cases, without a proper purpose. Yet. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that's the big paradox of data management, right? I I completely agree. I think management uh, at large also being having been a group uh, in a group of, of of managers, leaders, whatever you want to call that, right? I I remember those discussions quite uh, clearly that we had vivid discussions on many different parts of the business wanting to use data uh, for certain uh, purposes, anticipating that they could just go do that. <laughs> Not at all respecting that, okay, it takes, uh, first of all, it takes a data catalog. It takes some kind of data discovery platform where you can actually discover what data you have in, in your organization. And then we have the entire access, confidentiality, uh, sensitivity uh, talk. All of that needs to be in place. So it's kind of an infrastructure. And people just, people can't really get their heads around in many organizations, right? That it's not, you can, they expect, if we compare it to water, right? They expect all the pipes in the house to be in place so that when you open the tap, you just get water out. That's not how it works. You have to build the pipes first. You have to make you have to make those pipes discoverable. You need to know where the tab is. All that, and um, yeah, it's often neglected. Right. I want to I want to get a back to um, to to data democracy a little bit because you you mentioned sooner that part of your job is also to establish a cross functional data governance function inside a demand. I assume that is both very difficult just to get like the attention uh, necessary to per perform such a function is is that uh, or is it is it difficult it is difficult uh, but we are relying on a big uh, cross functional uh, program at the moment within uh, demand so we can have some uh, some leverage and reach the the C level people with presentation and and all that so oh, uh, good I'm glad but, to hear that yeah, at least. Uh, but it's it's more that you have to have management all around demand to preach this down their own lines of, of commands. And and that's difficult at the moment. So now it's both from the top and from the bottom that try to reach the middle, actually. So, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, but we are doing baby steps at the moment. And uh, I, th I think the child can walk at some point. Yeah. <laughs> But it's very, very long to establish these functions. If you want to get it right, data culture, to build a data culture, it takes years, right? It yeah. can't, can't just come in and show some fancy slides and then you have a data culture. It really, really takes years. And it but, also crashes a little bit about the safe implementation we're doing at the moment. So people are saying, no, oh, why should we uh, then have a data owner or data manager? Mm -hmm. Why do we have uh, the need of have some body being responsible for data part. We have the safe organization. So, you know, it's a class between multiple frameworks trying to do more or less the same things, mm. but with different roles. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a clash. It is a clash. It is. In all of the data governance function that I have seen and been part of, or even responsible for, I have had this feeling that there's something inherently undemocratic about data governance it's 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 kind of a it, it often comes down to who can muscle who in meetings and not i say i'd say the most democratic process of deciding okay how should our data look who can access what why and so forth i mean do is that something that you can also uh, recognize and if so how, what do you do to ensure that the data governance function is, is democratic in your organization as i see it the data governance board that i am leading is not a permanent solution it's merely a solution we have for the time being to establish the awareness of data and and try to have some guardrails and uh, and uh, policies but as i see it the data governance board should not live for more than a couple of years. And then we should have matured the organization enough to have the data managers or data owners to participating in some sort of community of practice or something that can discuss these things. So we don't have a overlay a board as, you, uh, as we have now. So it should be more democratic 
by the people actually responsible for the data mm-hmm. and not mm-hmm. not me as a data evangelist or something come and say what we should do or an architect should come and say what we should do it should mm-hmm. be more the people working with the data to have a mandate themselves so yeah. i see it as a, a starting point but not a permanent solution yeah yeah, yeah. i agree that would be uh... That's a good uh, that's a good approach actually to to simply say okay we we are establishing a data governance board but it's a temporary setup uh, and we will move towards uh, something that we consider to be a data democracy later on where people have been freed from this top layer of governance that is I guess it's uh, even though it's cross functional it's also fairly centralized right it must be part of yeah, yeah, more or less centralized, but but mm-hmm. with people from different parts of the organization. But but yeah, centralized. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, do you think you will get there? Do you think you will actually obtain a data democracy? Yeah, that's one of my hopes for for being in demand is actually trying to obtain this level of culture in uh, mm. or maturity in uh, in demand. Uh, I like the challenge, so mm. and it is a big challenge, bro, and it would take years. But mm. I really think that if the company should have a place in in the future, mm-hmm. we should have established this mm-hmm. rather sooner than later. Yeah, yeah. So I think you would have a fair chance of uh, of succeeding um, in this endeavor, but it is a it is a tough one. So what about the future of safe agile? Where do you say you mentioned the clash of several frameworks here? Uh, data governance or data management as a function will work, will be there forever. We will never be freed from the hassle of managing data. And no, no, but, but, but you could have an art uh, centralizing around data management, and mm-hmm. you have a, a data ops team or, mm-hmm. or a, a team that are focusing mainly on development and and then tooling and stuff like that you, you can have that in a in a safe framework but my concern is around the bi reporting the, the the small wins the small quick wins you can have with data where data is aligned and is is accessible for everyone or at least the bi teams the bi team should not wait the, the period of time for a PI planning to deliver value. They should deliver value from hour to an hour, day to day, week to week. They should not yeah. wait four weeks or eight weeks just yeah, because that... we have a cadence we should uh, go into. That was exactly the answer I was looking for prior, uh, earlier in the conversation when I was asking about information needs, right? <laughs> it doesn't fit. I mean, when people are searching for data, it doesn't really fit the cadence of a safe, agile setup. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's just two different things at play. Safe, agile is basically intended for building software. I mean, that's where the ideas come from, right? It's for building software in small parts where you release stuff, test it, and pull it back if it doesn't work quickly. That's definitely the key to all modern data. Uh, like uh, modern cloud technology uh, applications, that's that's a, that's a DevOps, that's a safe, agile setup. But it doesn't work for data management, or at least it doesn't work for BI. If people are asking, searching, and wanting to to see certain things, it should be way more dynamic, right? Yeah, I think so. I really yeah. think so. You can use the agile way of, way of working or the safe agile way of working, but for the big chunks, the, the mm-hmm. big task. Or mm-hmm. implementing a new uh, data platform, or yeah. try to implement uh, privacy uh, mm-hmm. concerns and, and all that into data management. It will take it's a, it's a big elephant that you have to chop up into smaller pieces, yeah. and that's is that is better suited for the the PI uh, cadence in uh, safe. I think. Mm-hmm. I agree. Or you can definitely pull it into that kind of setup, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, I have seen uh, waterfall setups also delivering, uh, but I have also seen a lot of waterfall <laughs> having a ridiculously high uh, time before they delivered anything, and then it didn't. And that's that's really the tragedy of waterfall, right? Um, 
Uh, yeah, I think sooner that we we are at the end. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming on, and I uh, I also want to encourage every listener out there to uh, follow sooner. Why should they follow you sooner? Um, primarily on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not present at uh, most uh, social media. I'm a little mm. data scared myself. Do you know? Mm. I'm only on uh, on LinkedIn. So sooner. Thank you for uh, taking the time and being on, and uh, thank you for your interesting thoughts. Yeah, and thank you all. Thank you for having me. Here are my takeaways from my conversation with Sunu. First, some data leader takeaways. And the first takeaway is, sometimes it's better to uh, read a novel than read a framework. Frameworks are boring, but to understand them, we need to read them, of course. But you can also read uh, IT novels about frameworks. That really gets under your skin faster and you get a lot of understanding in a smooth and even entertaining way. Second takeaway, you should consider that the same safe framework has some flaws when it comes to data management. Keep that in mind. And third takeaway, SAFE is good for building data architecture like data warehouses, data lakes, data lake houses, and so on. But in terms of having a delivery engine for smaller data management insights, uh, the same fra- framework is, is too slow and too rigorous. You need to have something even faster and even more flexible. And so that takes me to the data democracy takeaways. First of all, You should consider that your data desires in your organization shouldn't be reactive because it takes it doesn't take into account the total infrastructure needed to deliver on these data desires you should consider a data democracy as something that needs to have a data ops team and finally the third takeaway is that bi reporting and small data quick wins should have the complete freedom for frameworks. That would be the most data democratic way to go about it. So these were the takeaways from my conversation with Stuna. Thank you for listening and uh, be in touch.